Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingston, Texas, USA, with another episode of... <laughs> you know, you, you would think after all these years, it would just be like a reflex, you know, like something that just comes naturally. Rabbi Cross examines the news. This time, too, my, my, my brain went through Rabbi Singer, Rabbi Federer. I'm like, no, no, stop, stop, stop. Get your coffee first before the show. <laughs> Welcome back, Rabbi, with the Rabbi Cross, uh, Cross examines the New Testament. And this week, we are exploring Luke chapter 2. So what would be, what would be just before we even start, I'm just curious, what would be your, your most interesting uh, favorite part about Luke chapter 2? This summer, what because I'm gonna I'm gonna use this on the title you watch. <laughs> Do you have a favorite part about this this one so far? I actually I don't. <laughs> oh, okay. In that case, we'll just call this boring. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, <laughs> very good. All right. Well, welcome back, Rabbi. Welcome uh, people out there in the YouTube world. Uh, glad you're with us today. Um, I'm gonna pass it right along to you and take it away, boss. Okay, Luke chapter two. So it begins, and don't forget what we said last week was that Luke plays the historian and throws it a lot of detail and you know when you throw in a lot of detail it, it, it it's really it, it it's supposed to give you a lot of credibility i mean it's supposed to make you sound like you know what you were talking about but unfortunately luke's details get him into a lot of trouble so the chapter begins by saying that caesar augustus made a decree requiring a census to be taken of the entire roman empire and this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to register in their hometown. Everyone headed back to their place of origin. That's how the chapter begins. Now, there are really some serious problems with this beginning. Number one, there is no historical record at all of any census that was taken of the entire Roman Empire at this time. Um, so that, that's just for starters. Now, according to Josephus, in his book Antiquities, chapter 18, paragraph 1, so we're told that Quirinius actually did conduct a census, but it was about the year 6 or 7 of the Common Era, six or seven of the common era, what, what Christians refer to as AD, but we refer to normally as CE of the common era, six or seven. Now, according to Luke in chapter one, verse five, we did this last week, and according to Matthew chapter two, verse one, Jesus was born in the lifetime of King Herod the Great. That's very, very clear. Now, we know that King Herod the Great died in 4 BCE, 4 BCE. So this would have been about 10 years before the census of Quirinius. So this just presents a problem with the historical dating of this entire story. Now, I think the greatest problem here is what Luke says, and we're going to see in a minute why he says this, but it really is a terribly uh, absurd um, detail that Luke throws in when he says that everyone had to register in their hometown and everyone headed back to their place of origin. Now, the idea of people going back to their place of origin for a census is absolutely ridiculous. The whole purpose of a census is not just to find out how many people are living at a particular time, but the purpose is to know where the people are living for the purpose of taxation, meaning that you want to know where people are in order to collect taxes from them. And the idea of sending people back to their ancestral city didn't serve any purpose. There'd be absolutely no purpose in doing that. It would actually be counterproductive because people would 
maybe stay there for a week during the census and then go back to where they were living. And so who cares where they originally came from? They're not living there. And so this doesn't make any sense at all. But unfortunately, Luke was forced to come up with this literary device, basically where, and it is absolutely zero historical evidence that any, that in any census, people were required to do this. But we'll see in a moment why Luke was in a sense, his hand was forced to have Joseph um, and Mary travel back to uh, what is allegedly their place of origin. So in verse four, the story goes on and Luke tells us that Joseph went up from the Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, which is where he was living. And where does he go? He goes to Judea, the area called Judea, to the city of David, which is called Beit Lechem. Christians called Bethlehem, but Bethlehem is basically Beit Lechem, the house of bread. And why does Joseph go back to Beit Lechem in the area of Judea? Again, he was living in Nazareth, which is in the Galil in the north. He goes down to the area of Beit Lechem because he was of the house and family of David. That's all that... Um, Luke tells us that because Joseph was from the house and family of David, he is required to go back to the city of Beit Lechem for the purposes of this census. Now, what you find going on in the Gospels is actually very, very interesting. And it's confusing. And it would be really helpful if you diagram this for yourself, um, because basically what you have are two entirely different uh, narratives that are presented in the Gospels of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke. So what happens is here that Matthew and Luke are each dealing with a problem. It's really the same kind of problem, but they tackle the problem in very different ways. So what happens in Matthew, if you remember, is that it seems that the hometown of Joseph and Mary is Beit Lechem. That's what you have apparently in the Gospel of Matthew, that Mary and Joseph, they live in Beit Lechem, that's their hometown. And the problem that Matthew faced was, how do you get um, Jesus to Nazareth? Meaning that if, if the parents of Jesus, they were always living in Beit Lechem, so, the, the problem that Matthew had was that he had a tradition that <laughs> the, the strange tradition that the Messiah would somehow be associated with the city of Nazareth. And it was important for Matthew to get Jesus ultimately to Nazareth in order to have him associated with that city. Um, and so what was the solution of Matthew? Matthew's solution, in, and it's a long story in Matthew, is that the family of Jesus, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, they are forced to flee Beit Lechem. They have to leave Beit Lechem because they get word from an angel that Herod is going to seek to kill the baby Jesus. And what do they do in the Gospel of Matthew? They get out of Dodge very quickly and they flee to Egypt. They stay in Egypt because, again, Herod is gunning for the baby Jesus. And we're told in Matthew's Gospel that after Herod's death, so after Herod dies, and I guess now it's, you know, the danger is apparently over. After the death of Herod, it's safe now to return from Egypt. Now, where would they go? Normally, where would they go? They'd go back to Beit Lechem, which is where they're living. But Matthew tells us that because Herod's son 
was ruling in Judea. So, and that's again where Beit Lechem is. So Matthew tells us that because there was still danger in Judea, in the area of Beit Lechem, Jesus and his family at that point head north. They head north and they go to the Galil, to the Galilee, to the, to the town of Nazareth. And according to Matthew, they moved to this particular town, meaning why they could have gone anywhere in the Galilee, right? The, the Galilee is a big region. Why do they go specifically to Nazareth? So according to the second chapter, the ending of the second chapter of Matthew, they moved to Nazareth to, and this is actually very funny when you think about it, they moved to Nazareth to fulfill the alleged prophecy from the Hebrew Bible that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene, meaning that the Messiah would be associated with the city of Nazareth. Now, <laughs> we saw back when we studied Matthew that there is absolutely zero, there's no such prophecy anywhere in the Tanakh. This is basically something that Matthew invents out of whole cloth. He manufactures this kind of prophecy. And, <laughs> And if there was such a prophecy, this is the sort of the funny part, it would be the most absurd kind of fulfillment of messianic prophecy, meaning that, that there's sort of a known idea that the Messiah would be associated with the city of Nazareth. And so to fulfill that prophecy, the family of Jesus moved to Nazareth. That's what you would call, uh, you know, a very <laughs> bizarre messianic fulfillment. In any event, there is no such prophecy, and uh, why they had to move specifically to Nazareth is totally unclear. But that's what happens. Again, in Matthew's gospel, again, this is what you have to bear in mind. Joseph and Mary, their town where they live is Beit Lechem. And Matthew's problem is, uh-oh, uh, the Messiah has to be somehow from Nazareth. How are we going to get baby Jesus to Nazareth? So again, Matthew comes up with this whole crazy story that Jesus was in great danger. Herod wanted to kill baby Jesus. Matthew says that, that, that even though uh, Joseph and Mary and Jesus gave Herod's troops the slip, they ended up killing all the Jewish babies under the age of two in the city of Nazareth and all the surrounding cities. Again, a story which has no historical corroboration. In any event, in Matthew's narrative, they go down to Egypt. They stay there, according to most scholars, for approximately two to three years. They stay in Egypt. And then when Herod dies, it's now the coast is clear. They're able to come back. But they are still told, you know, you better not go back to Beit Lechem, it's still dangerous there because Herod's son is still ruling in the area of Judea. So they go north to the Galil, to the Galilee, and they end up in Nazareth. And that's how in the Matthew narrative, in the Gospel of Matthew, they get the family of Jesus to Nazareth, um, even though their town of origin is Beit Lechem. However, here in Luke, it's a very, very different story. In Luke, it's a reversal of the situation that you had in Matthew, because here in Luke, it seems that the hometown of Joseph and Mary is Nazareth. You see that, by the way, confirmed not just here in Luke chapter two, but in the Gospel of John chapter seven, verse 41, it's also pretty clear that Jesus and Mary and Joseph, they were from Nazareth. And by the way, that's what Jesus is always called, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Nazarene. Um, so in Luke, that is the hometown. That's where Jesus and Mary and Joseph lived. They always lived in Nazareth. And what Luke needs is a literary device to get them to Beit Lechem. So again, they each had their need. Matthew had to get the family to Nazareth and, and Luke has to get the family to Beit Lechem for the birth of Jesus. 
Now, why in the world would Luke need to get them to Beit Lechem? Because the Christians understood, actually they misunderstood, a passage from the prophet Micha, which associated the Messiah with um, the city of Beit Lechem. Again, the way Christians misunderstood Micha, the prophet Micha, or they pronounce it Micah, chapter 5, is that the Messiah himself has to be from the city of Beit Lechem. That's not what the prophet Micha actually says. What Micha says is that the ancestor of the Messiah, which was King David, he was associated with Beit Lechem, not the Messiah himself. That's the misunderstanding that Christians make. And that was the misunderstanding that Luke had had as well, that he assumed that the Messiah himself had to be um, from Beit Lechem. And so what Luke needed to do was to get Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus to Beit Lechem because they were not living there. They were living in Nazareth. And how does he get them to Beit Lechem? So Luke comes up with this absurd story of a census where everyone had to return to their city of origin, to their ancestral city. And Luke here says that Beit Lechem was the city of David. Now, this is actually questionable because according to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, and in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 10, and in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 1, what is the city of David? So in the Tanakh, the city of David is Jerusalem. In the Tanakh, the city of David is not identified as Beit Lechem. We know that, that King David's father, Yishai, Jesse, he was from Beit Lechem. In any event, this is the quagmire that Luke gets himself in, into because, again, he has a literary problem. In verse 5, um, so what, what, what are we told in verse 5? So Joseph, in the previous verse, in verse 4, we're told Joseph traveled to Beit Lechem, and verse 5 tells us that he went there to register for the census, with Mary, now listen carefully, he registers in Beit Lechem for the census with Mary, who was engaged to him, and she was pregnant. She was pregnant. She was carrying a child. Now, it's very important to understand that being engaged back then was not equivalent to our contemporary concept of engagement. We have this understanding, you know, in our world of what it means to be engaged. But back then, engagement was a very, very different matter. Essentially, 2,000 years ago in the Jewish world, engagement was essentially equivalent to marriage. What happened back then was a couple got engaged. They didn't really call it engaged. It was only, that wasn't the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is called Kiddushin, and Kiddushin was essentially, uh, let's say, the first stage of marriage, and it was legally considered a marriage. When a person got, so to speak, engaged back then, which was, again, the stage called Kiddushin, they were essentially married for all intents and purposes. What did that mean? It meant that if they wanted to end the relationship at this time, they needed to get divorced. Now, in our contemporary world, when a couple gets engaged and they decide to break the engagement, that's all they do. They break the engagement. They don't need to go through a legal divorce. But back then, since engagement, again, it wasn't called engagement, it was called kiddushin, but because that was technically a marriage, it was a marriage that took place, if they wanted to break the relationship at that point, they had to actually get divorced. And also another uh, reality here is that if the woman during this period of time 
was unfaithful, that was considered adultery because she was again a married woman. So what happened back then was that normally they would get, again, we'd call it engaged. They would have this period of time called Kiddushim where they were again legally married, but during this period of time, they did not live together. During this first stage of marriage, they did not live together. During this time, the husband was engaged for approximately a year setting up their home. And after this period of time, they would enter into the second phase of marriage, which was called Nisu'in. And then they would actually begin living together as man and wife. That's how things took place 2,000 years ago. So there were several reasons because of this why Mary would not be accompanying Joseph at this point to Beit Lechem. Again, Luke has, in verse 5, Mary accompanying Luke to Beit Lechem. And he says, because they were engaged. But there are reasons why she would not have been accompanying him to Beit Lechem at this stage. Number one, they had not yet entered into the final stage of marriage and they were not yet living together so it would have been a little bit awkward to travel together you have to get two separate places to stay so they were not again married at the stage at the level where they were living together number two going all the way from Beit Lechem to to I'm sorry going all the way from Nazareth to Beit Lechem would have been a long and perilous journey at that time for a woman who is in the last stages of pregnancy. Don't forget they didn't have, you know, smooth trains or cars back then. The, the, the trip was basically on the back of a donkey. Um, so this would have been a very, very difficult thing for a woman who ostensibly is in approximately the, the ninth month of her pregnancy to travel all the way from um, Beit Lechem, I'm sorry, from Nazareth to Beit Lechem, it would have been a ridiculous trip for her to take. And, and thirdly, there's no indication that her family originated in Beit Lechem. We're told that Joseph's family of origin, his place of origin was Beit Lechem, and that's why he would have to go back there, but nothing about her family, her place of origin. In verses six to seven, we're told that they get to Beit Lechem and Mary gives birth to Jesus and they laid him in a manger. They laid Jesus in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. There's no room in the inn. They had to it's almost like what's going on now. I, I live about 45 minutes from Niagara Falls. No, actually more than 45 minutes, probably more like uh, an hour and a half. It's from Niagara Falls from where I'm living. And they're having over a million people going there today for the eclipse. And there's literally no room anywhere in any place to stay there. They're charging a fortune for any hotel room. So what Luke tells us is that they couldn't find a place in, um, in Beit Lechem. So they had to stay in a manger. Now, this is a little bit hard to understand because again, if Joseph's family was from Beit Lechem, if this is his personal hometown, if he was born there, so he probably knew people in Beit Lechem. And you would think that he and Mary could have stayed with friends or could have stayed with family. It wasn't as if they were showing up in a town where they had no connections, where they had no roots. So it is a little bit strange. I'm not saying this is a, a, a an un, that it's a, a problem that you can't deal with, but it's again a little bit strange sounding that Joseph now is heading back home and you would think that he knows people in uh, Beit Lechem and yet 
they're forced to stay in a manger. In verse 22, so we're told that when the days, now listen carefully to the text here. Luke says, when the days for their, for their, T-H-E-I-R, the days for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, there are three observations I'd like to share about this verse. Number one, why does Luke speak about their purification? According to Torah law, there was only a purification procedure for a woman who gives birth. Nothing for the baby. There was absolutely nothing that had to be done with the baby that was born to purify them, to become pure. There was no ritual at all. So, and it's interesting, by the way, just in terms of timing, this purification for the woman who gives birth, this is described in this week's Torah portion that we're going to read about next Shabbat, Torah portion of Tazria, which is in Leviticus chapter 12. And it speaks about exactly what has to happen for a woman who gives birth to a male child or if she gives birth to a female child. But there was a procedure of purification for a woman who gives birth. For some reason, Luke assumes incorrectly that there was something that needed to be done for the child as well. Now, some people, I've seen some Christian commentaries say, well, when, when Luke says their purification, he was not referring to Mary and Jesus. He was referring to Mary and Joseph. But there was also absolutely no purification procedure from the Bible for the father as well. So there's just no way of reading this verse in a way that makes sense. That's the first observation I wanted to share on this verse. The second observation is that Luke here says that they went to Jerusalem after the days of her purification, by the way, which would have been 40 days after the birth of Jesus. So the, the procedure for a woman who gives birth would be that after the birth, she was ritually impure for seven days. The circumcision would have been on the eighth day. And then she had to count 33 days until she'd be able to go into the temple again or the temple precincts. Now, the problem here is obvious. Uh, this is a huge problem at this point. Because according to the second chapter of Matthew, Jesus was in grave danger after being born. Matthew tells us he was in grave danger after being born because Herod was told by the wise men that the little baby Messiah, um, you know, is up there somewhere in, in Nazareth, uh, and, and Bethlehem, I'm sorry, in Bethlehem. And so Herod sends troops and they kill. Again, as Matthew, the, the story in Matthew chapter 2 tells us, Herod's men kill all the Jewish babies under the age of two, in Beit Lechem and in all the surrounding cities. By the way, it's interesting that in the King James Version, it says all the coasts thereof. He didn't know, King James translators didn't know that Beit Lechem is landlocked. There are no coasts around Beit, about, around Beit Lechem. Um, so the, the better translation would be not the coasts around it, but the surrounding areas, the surrounding cities. In any event, what you see from the story in Matthew is that baby Jesus would have been in great, great, great danger after his birth. And so because of this, because of this, in Matthew's story, what do they do? They flee to Egypt. They get out of Dodge. They go far, far away to get away from Herod and his uh, troops that are coming to kill Jesus. Now, again, most scholars estimate, as I said, that they stayed in Egypt for about two to three years. But Luke, Luke incredibly mentions absolutely nothing about this flight to Egypt. Or he doesn't mention any danger 
to the infant Jesus. And instead, he has Jesus and his family going up to Jerusalem 40 days after his birth, 40 days after his birth, I'm sorry, and uh, they seem to have no concerns at all. The third problem I wanted to point out is that Luke here says that they took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, to present him to the Lord. So clearly what you see from this verse in Luke is that Jesus himself was not seen as the Lord. Again, we've seen this over and over and over and over again. Virtually, I would say 99% of the, of the material in the Christian Bible that we've studied so far, you see that the writers did not view Jesus as God himself. That's quite clear here. In verse 25, we're told that there was a man in Jerusalem back then whose name was Shimon. His name was Shimon. And this man, was, we're told, was righteous and devout, and he was looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. The spirit of holiness was upon him. Now, we saw back in chapter 1, regarding Zechariah and Elizabeth, who were the parents of John the Baptizer, that they were both righteous. They were both righteous. And Shimon here as well is described as righteous. And this is without believing in Jesus. And again, this goes completely contrary to what Paul consistently teaches in his writings that we are not able to be righteous. According to the teachings of Paul, primarily, all human beings are born stained with the sin of Adam and Eve and that we are incapable of resisting the sway of Satan in our lives. All of us are miserable sinners, as they say the T in tulip is that we were totally depraved. And yet what you see is that no, on the contrary, it is possible for people to be righteous and devout, contrary to what Paul insists in all of his writings. In verse 26, it's, it says the following. It was revealed to Shimon that he would not die before seeing God's Christ, before seeing God's Messiah. So we see once again that the writers of the Greek Testament did not believe Jesus was God. Because how do they refer to Jesus here as God's? Messiah as God's anointed one. They don't refer to Jesus here as God. They refer to him as God's Messiah in the same way that in the Tanakh, people like David and Shaul and Shlomo Solomon, they're referred to as God's anointed ones, as God's Messiahs. In verse 33, Shimon was praising the baby Jesus in very glowing terms. Let's look at what Shimon says in verses 28 to 32. This is what this righteous man, Shimon, in Jerusalem is saying about the baby Jesus. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. This is what this Simon says about the baby Jesus. And what does it say in verse 33 here in Luke? It says that his father and mother were amazed at the things that were being said about Jesus. Now think about it. This Simon speaks about Jesus in glowing terms. And Luke tells us that his parents, Joseph and Mary, were just amazed at what was being said about Jesus. 
But why would they be amazed? Why would Joseph and Mary have been shocked and amazed by what Simon, what Shimon here is saying? Because don't they remember? Didn't, don't they remember that just one chapter earlier, what an uh, angel allegedly told them? Again, remember what in Luke chapter one, an angel tells Mary. He says, the angel says, great will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. This is what Mary was told already. She was told basically that her son is going to be a, that's a, going to be the son of God who's going to be the Messiah and his reign is going to be over the whole world forever and ever. So why would Joseph and Mary have been amazed here at what Shimon has declared. Clearly, uh, in chapter two, they don't remember what the angel said back in chapter one. In verses 36 to 39, there's a prophetess, we're told a prophetess named Anna, and she began giving thanks to God and spoke of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So this prophetess Anna is speaking about Jesus and she began thanking God about Jesus. And again, we have a difficulty here, a number of difficulties. Number one, this Anna is referred to as a prophetess. And the reality is that back then at that point in Jewish history, prophecy had ended. There was no prophets at that time. Prophecy ended about 2,400 years prior to this. So the only way that you could possibly refer to her as a prophetess is if you were lose, using the term prophet very loosely, like some people today would say that Steve Jobs from Apple was a prophet. So obviously he wasn't a biblical prophet in the sense of Deuteronomy chapter 18, for example, but clearly she is not a female prophet in the sense of a real biblical prophet. Number two, and this is an important observation to just remember. We mentioned last week that Luke reveals, and if you read Luke's writings carefully, he reveals what people at that time were actually expecting for the Messiah to be and for what the Messiah to do. So if you remember at the end of chapter one, you had the song of Zechariah. Again, Zechariah was the father of John the Baptizer. But listen to how he speaks about this baby who's going to be born. He says, beginning in chapter, again, 1, verse 68, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us, in the house of his servant David, as he has said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him, all of our days. This is the biblical messianic vision. If you were to ask Jews back then, what are you expecting for the Messiah to do and to be? And if you ask Jews today or any time in Jewish history, Zechariah's speech is exactly what the Jewish messianic vision is all about. It wasn't about believing in someone who's going to come and die for our sins as a sacrifice. It was about someone who was going to redeem us from our exile, from our enemies, and set us up to be able to serve God properly. So you're going to see throughout the book of Luke, this picture of what the Messiah is supposed to be, Luke confirms. So again, you see it at the end of chapter one, 
You see it in chapter 2 in verse 11, where the Messiah is described as a savior. And again, remember that in the Tanakh, a savior did not save people from their sins. You go through the book of Judges, for example, God raised up saviors to save the people from their enemies. And that's what Zechariah says at the end of Luke chapter 1, that this saving here is from our enemies. And then in chapter 2, verses 30 to 32, there's the praise of Shimon, who again praises Jesus as a savior who's going to rescue the Jewish people. Then we saw the song of Anna in chapter 2, verse 38. What does she speak about? The redemption of Jerusalem. The redemption of Jerusalem. And then, again, as you see later on in the book of Luke, in chapter 24, verse 21, when you have the disciples of Jesus, two of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they don't recognize Jesus. This is supposedly after his resurrection. But that what do they say to this person? They were dejected. They were upset. Here they saw Jesus crucified, and they see a person now. They don't recognize it's Jesus. And they say, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel at this time. That was their hope and their expectation, that Jesus would redeem Israel. This is the biblical concept of the Messiah. And that's what Luke is revealing to us throughout his writings. In verse 40, Luke says here that the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. What do you see from this verse? That it's absolutely clear that this child was not God. Obviously, if we're told that the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him, obviously the child is not God. Now, in verses 41 to 50, so in verses 41 to 50, you basically have the first recorded version of the movie Home Alone. I mean, it's an early version of the movie Home Alone, where Jesus gets separated from his parents and they end up leaving Jerusalem. They don't know what happened to the kid. They're not even sure that he's gone at this point. And they realize that he's not there with them. And they go back to Jerusalem looking for him. And then in verse 46, it says that after three days, after three days, they found him in the temple. Listen carefully. They found Jesus in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers. And he's going back and forth with the teachers. But this is a detail that most people miss. And again, Luke shows here that he was unfamiliar with what actually went on and didn't go on in the temple. Because the reality was that no one, no one was allowed to sit in the temple except for a Davidic king. This was the law. You'll find this in Tractate Sanhedrin, page 101, that no one was allowed to sit in the temple area except for a Davidic king. So this idea that Jesus is sitting with the teachers in the temple, again, it just didn't happen. And Luke is unaware of what really went on and didn't go on in the temple. In verse 49, Luke tells us that he said to his parents, Jesus says to his parents, why is it that you were looking for me? Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? And in verse 50, it says they did not understand that statement, which he had made to them. Now, again, why didn't they understand that statement? Obviously, Jesus, when he says that I have to be in my father's house, was not talking about Joseph's house. He was talking about God's house. But why is that shocking to them? 
because didn't they take the angel's message seriously back in chapter one at his birth where the angel said that he'll be called the son of God. So it's pretty clear that these stories do not are not both possible. You can't have both of these stories going on at the same time. Finally, we'll end with verse 52 where it says Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. One more time, verse 52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. So again, one more time, I don't want to beat this dead horse too many times. <laughs> Obviously, from this verse you see, Jesus was not God. And secondly, this verse, as we saw in the Gospel of Matthew, this verse runs into the Christian interpretation of Isaiah chapter 53. Because Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, says that the servant of the Lord will be despised and rejected of men. Despised and rejected of men. And what you see in the Gospels, we saw it many times in Matthew, and here we're seeing it in Luke. Jesus was not despised and rejected. On the contrary, he was quite popular. And Luke ends this chapter by telling us that his popularity kept on increasing. So again, if you wanted to speak about Jesus being the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, Luke should never tell us that his popularity and his stature were growing and increasing. Luke should have told us that Jesus kept on winning the least popular boy in school contest year after year, right. the most hated kid in school. Not the case. So this is, again, another inconsistency between the Gospels and the Christian interpretation of Isaiah 53. I have another. Okay. I have, I have a, a question for you. Um, why do you reckon? Hold on, let me clear my screen here. Why do you suppose um, you know Jesus is referred to as the bread of life and born in Bethlehem, house of bread? I mean, for a, when I was a messianic, that was kind of a huge deal, you know, because they were all into you know hidden meanings and all this other stuff. So, would you have any comments uh, regarding that? Well, I mean, that's part of the hype is that, you know, if they associate Jesus with Beit Lechem, the house of bread, so they want to speak about him as the bread of life, um, the staff of life, the bread of life. It's also interesting that Christians, um, they, they pull a little bit of a switcheroo with the book of Proverbs, where Proverbs speaks about um Basically, it's, it's wisdom, um, and Christians will identify all of the passages in Proverbs that speak about wisdom as actually speaking about Jesus. Um, but really, it, the understanding has always been that Proverbs is speaking in those passages about, about the Torah. Okay, female. And Torah is right. always described as bread. Gotcha. Um, the Torah so, is feminine, yeah. right? I mean, also... Wisdom, she, wisdom, right? Not he. Well, yeah, it's it's a it's a feminine there. Yeah. And and by basically having Jesus as bread, it's a way again of identifying him with wisdom, with Torah. Hmm. Um. So yeah, I mean, this is a, a a a popular game that Christians play to see how many allusions and hints and types and shadows. And right. Et right. They're able to find for Jesus. And and my um, final thought is, was there anywhere in Torah where it says, where there's a prophecy that says the Messiah will be called uh, the bread of life? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. So which means Unless anybody it's... born in Beit Lechem could say, no, I'm the bread of life. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, but the problem is there's no prophecy anywhere about the Messiah himself being either born in Beit Lechem <laughs> or even being from the town of Beit Lechem, the only thing that the Tanakh tells us is that the Messiah who will come in the future, he will be a descendant of King David, who is associated with Beit Lechem. 
Um, but there's nothing at all that somehow connects the future Messiah with the town of Beit Lechem. That's just a, a, a misunderstanding that Christians have about Micha chapter 5. Unless, of course, it is David himself coming back. <laughs> well, there is, by the way, there is <coughs> such a belief, because right. in Tanakh, the Messiah is sometimes called David. Now, obviously, what it means, because you have to go through all of the references, um, and so generally, it doesn't refer to the Messiah as David. He's usually referred to as the descendant of David, as a branch, a seed of the, a, a branch from David, um, it's pretty clear that what it means when it says the Messiah is David, it means a descendant of David from the line of David. Okay. But the, you could theoretically, if a person wanted to, is to say, okay, David's going to be resurrected and he'll be the future Messiah. It wouldn't be heresy to say such a thing. Right. Right. Um, but it's not really normally what's expected. Very good. Well, Rabbi, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. I uh, look forward to seeing you same time, same place, as Shim willing, next week. Now, we'll say uh, Pes- Pesach is coming up, and I believe it falls on a Monday evening, but I'm pretty sure you're going to be unavailable because usually that day you're in a full preparation mode. So uh, as we get closer to that, we'll up- update it? everybody. That's, that's what it says in the Christian Bible, the day of preparation. <laughs> We, we, we won't call it that then. <laughs> um, so, very good. Okay, Rabbi, thank you again for your time, and thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you uh, next time. Take care, everybody. Shalom. Bye. Shalom, my dear friends. Shalom, shalom. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going, and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Shaifa